Hello and welcome to the Ella Mawsonary Moment. My name is Aaron Spears. Robotic as ever, and I'm the motherfucking Brad Hathcock. Um, welcome to the first episode of 2024. Yeah! And it's Fuck also my yeah. favorite episode. Uh, I do, You've done I, two fucking years of this, dude. Two yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. How wild is that? I've never committed to anything other than my wife for more than two years. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool, actually. Um, I used to do I, – I, I've done top movie lists like every year for like as long as I can remember because I'm just a weirdo guy. Um, but it was, it's nice to have somebody do it with me now, mostly because you can like kind of uh, – you know, you watch stuff that I don't watch and I watch stuff you don't watch. And That's so right. it's, an, it's a nice mix. Uh, I, I and think then our especially this. I, I know that there's a few movies that are going to be on both of our lists in different order for sure. For uh, sure. But I think that this list is going to be wildly different um, than like, um, what I, we saw last, so, last year. Yeah. And I was going to say about last year, too. Um, we did that episode and people listened. And actually, we turned other people onto stuff they wouldn't have normally watched. Yeah, I think and that I was, thought that was our really most cool. downloaded episode of the year last year. Yeah, and um, so, so I, and I, I would why... like to shout out to um, to everyone. Uh, you know, I, I shared with you a, a Facebook memory that I had of um, this time, close to this time last year. We had 500 total downloads for last year. Um, I think we far surpassed that possibly this year. Um, so thank you for everybody that that's listening. Yeah. And to all our listeners, a, a happy 2024. Um, I hope it's better than what I'm thinking it's going to be, which is going to be awful. Um, <laughs> okay. So anyway, with all that out of the way, um, why waste any time? Let's get started. I want to first do movies that I think, that we haven't got the chance to see, but I think would have made, it would have been on my list to see that I can't watch it. And then mm. we should move into our notable mentions. And then we'll start with the 15. Okay. Um, so, so one off my list, I have not gotten to see yet, uh, but I know you have and might be on your list. No spoilers here. Uh, Killers of the flower moon. Um, it's just in the timing that it came out. It, I didn't want to buy the movie or rent it for $20 or whatever, because it's going to be on Apple TV for free. It's an, it's an Apple property. Um, so that's one for me that I just did not get to see yet. Um, but is definitely on my list to see regardless of what year it came out. Um, I've got four here, uh, that I haven't gotten to see that I want to see and could have made my list of notables or 15, um, for number one, Ferrari, I want to see it, but it just came out in the theaters. Um, number two, Priscilla. Um, number three, The yeah, Holdovers and Paul Giamatti. Uh, I, I bought it on Blu-ray, but it won't be here until this afternoon. Um, <laughs> and then number four, and the most sad one of all, is Godzilla Minus One. I tried multiple times. The first time, the, the hard drive that the movie projector was using crashed halfway through and it was corrupted they gave me a free ticket to go back i tried to go back again and they shut off they shut down the highway to get down there and i i just for whatever reason i was not able to see that movie so i only saw the first half of it and it was actually extremely good so Dude, they are just unleashing godzilla upon the planet like constantly now <clears throat> It's every year there's one or two fucking Godzilla movies coming out. Because even this year we have Godzilla uh, X-Kong or whatever, and they're supposed to team up for whatever Kong villain there is out there. Uh, those those American movies are pretty much garbage. The Japanese ones used to be garbage, and they're actually getting better because their budgets are smaller. Like I think this movie only cost $15 million to make. So oh, the fact that nice. it was like... yeah. Anyway, it, it's also a period piece in, in set in World War II, which is like kind of awesome. Like, I don't think Godzilla's ever gotten to do that. Anyway, uh, so f let's hear your your notables. You want to go back and forth? Do you want to just list them all out? Like, what we'll did, what didn't make your list? Back and forth. Uh, 
So one of the first movies that did not make my list, and quite frankly, I think it's because, and this might be on yours as well, as we did kind of talk about this one on the last podcast, was Skin Marink. Uh, big reason for me it not making the list is there's some good fucking movies this year, man. And it, it's such a small, low-budget style film, um, and it's not for everybody. Um, it's absolutely not for everybody. I get that. Um, so this might not be your cup of tea, even as far as the horror <clears throat> genre goes. It's very experimental. Um, I mean, beautifully shot well, in 90s, on that one. 90s home movie style. But, <clears throat> you know, that hold one just on did that. not make mm-hmm. my list. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that one a little more in a minute. Um, I'm going to go with one of mine. Uh, it did make my list. Uh, John Wick 4. Look, I love those John Wick movies. I think they're great. I I thought this one was cool, too. Not as good as the other three, and I just think there were better movies. So that's one that didn't make my list. I'm going to go with uh, Kandahar, um, Gerard Butler. Mm. Um, Good movie, definitely uh, a very solid movie. But when it came down to some of the other like war based movies and and things of that nature, um, especially another one that is on my list, this one was quite good. Um, Gerard Butler's really having a renaissance, uh, in my opinion, for movies like this. But he's also releasing shitty movies like Plane, which seems like it would almost be somewhat similar. Um, but it's not, and he plays kind of a pussy in it. Um, <clears throat> so I went with Kandahar. It, it was quite good, and I do recommend it. Uh, one that we talked about yesterday, and I don't think you knew that <clears throat> it was actually quite good, was Dungeons & Dragons. <clears throat> um, good movie. Funny, entertaining. Just a, It was just a fun movie. I just It just couldn't make the top 15. Got it. Uh, I'm going to go with Nefarious. Um, I personally ah. love this movie. Um, it was very much hated by the left, uh, so I had to watch it. Anything that they're <laughs> up in arms over, I have to watch. Um, but kudos to uh, Sean Patrick Flannery. Uh, really just For carried going that bonkers. movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he went balls to the wall in this movie, and I loved it. I know he's not like an A-list actor by any means, but... He, he carried this movie uh, truly, and I thought that the premise of it was actually very solid, very good. Um, I do recommend it. Yeah, it. Uh, I, I thought the ending was horrible when he goes on Glenn Beck's show. I was like, okay, well, what are we I doing mean, here? But on. can't have a conservative uh, it, it, movie without Glenn Beck. It was. It was. Uh, yeah, it was interesting. Um, I'm gonna. I have on my list here: Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. Um, look, I love the Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, I think they're cool characters. They're funny. They're standalone movies. They don't have to adhere to the whole like connected whatever. They just kind of are. And it was nice to say goodbye to those characters because that was pretty much it. There's there's no more Guardians of the Galaxy. It, it's over. Um, yeah. The last one I have that specifically listed under uh, under my honorable mentions is the channel. Uh, this was a very little known like heist movie um, i've never heard of it it was quite good it it had some really new interesting pieces to it um and you know not any a list probably even b level actors um and i believe it takes place somewhere in uh england or something uh but very good uh quite enjoyed it uh i would watch it again definitely um, but it, it's kind of like it's up there with a movie kind of like Triple Nine, right? Like not a lot of people had heard of the movie Triple Nine, uh, but it's got a really good cast to it. And it was such a, a good film. And, and I just don't think people really paid paid attention to it. And like it didn't do well at the box office, but it was like very gritty, violent style movie in Triple Nine. And um, I like this one for similar reasons. Okay, um, I've got a lot more than you, so I'll just roll through them pretty quickly. Um, Asteroid City, I enjoyed it. I Didn't thought get it to was. Watch it yet. Uh, the sets are really cool. I, I, it's just one of those. Um, uh, Haunting in Venice, nice, fun, silly. You know, how are they doing this like trickery, and and is it is the place really haunted or not? And 
throughout the movie, it's like, aha, it's, it's all fake. And then it's like, oh, maybe not. Oh, it is. Oh, but maybe not. And uh, I enjoyed that. I, I like I liked that character. I turned that one off. That one didn't uh, didn't carry my Didn't do it attention. for you? Just didn't carry my attention. <clears throat> That's all. Um, I read The Passenger. Um, the Passenger was a movie about a guy who is having a bad day at work at a fast food restaurant. And one of his coworkers comes in and shoot murders everybody and then they go for a drive for the day and the there's the guy one guy's the passenger the other guy's the driver and the driver is out of his fucking mind and uh, it ends with like a crazy suicide by cop thing so it was really interesting oh, um i'm pretty sure i heard of this movie but i, I um some of these some movies came out like late that weren't really like announced at any part of the year or i didn't see a trailer for and so I may have missed yeah, this them one... just kind of because they didn't, they just didn't come on my radar fast enough. <clears throat> I have divinity on here. You just recommended this one out of the blue and it was wild. Absolutely wild. I'll tell all I'll say that movie is wild. Um, I have on my list here, super Mario, um, the biggest movie of the year. I think, um, look I, as a kid, I, I love, I love video games Every single frame in that movie has some reference to something Nintendo. And um, for that alone, I appreciated it because you'd have to really know a lot about video games to get a lot of these references. Um, but also, it was just a fun, silly movie. Um, I think we should let it be known going into this list that I intentionally watch like really bad movies um, comparatively to you. Um, like... There are just movies that I I know are not going to be good, um, but I I watch them anyway. So that's why a lot I, like, I don't have a lot of honorable mentions either. Because while I've watched well over a hundred movies this year, um, none a of them, lot are, good. Of them <laughs> are bad. Yeah, a lot of them are bad. We talked about them last episode. Um, two more, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's. Look, I don't know anything about Five Nights Fair. at Freddy's. I never played the games. That movie was actually surprisingly fine like it was it kinda, oh, yeah. i was surprised by it too i was like oh these are there's some cool designs and stuff was it the uh he was what with the killer in the first scream or one of the killers it, it, it's basically uh, what, the plot of scream name? oh yeah it's it's exactly the, the uh matthew lillard yeah he was in it um i think the kid played Peta in the hunger games was that him i have no I, idea i'm pretty sure that was him um I also never played Five Nights at Freddy's at Freddy's, but um, I will say this movie was pretty decent considering. Yeah, it had it had cool special effects. Like I just liked the, the the they they went hard into like the physical silly looking robots. I wish it was rated R. I I want to see a rated R version of it where there's actually blood and gore and stuff because uh, there wasn't a lot of that. Um, it was it's a kids game. Yeah, but it's a kids but, horror but game. Give me like an adult like an adult version of it and and i'm good um i i did enjoy that movie i will say i probably don't need to or want to watch it over again um but no. it was nice it came for free on peacock so yeah it and nice i watched to be able to watch some shit for free so i told you yesterday my number 14 i had four movies slotted for that and i couldn't figure out which one to pick before i finally did uh sound of freedom was one of those um that was a legitimately good movie about a very dark subject and i don't think a movie's ever tackled it before just child sex trafficking and it's dark it's real unpleasant to watch but uh it was a good movie so uh maybe it made your list uh we'll find out i'm ready to go that's it okay you want to go first or you want to go second uh you go first okay Number 15, Winnie the fucking Pooh. You know it was going to be on the list, dude. Doesn't matter how bad it was. It's still going to be one of the best movies of the year. Okay? <laughs> Welcome to 2024 now, where we're getting all kinds of free shit coming out. Mickey Mouse is on the fucking, you know, Steamboat Willie, on the public domain. Here we go. We're going to get all kinds of shitty fucking horror movies, and I'm here for it. Okay? Winnie the Pooh was great. And the second one comes out this year. So, you already know that it's going to be on the list for next year. <laughs> Maybe not. The, the nostalgia factor definitely was huge for me in this one. But just take the quintessential slasher um, algorithm and 
just fucking put Winnie the Pooh and Piglet in there. <laughs> and like, that's what you had. Like, it was just a very by the book slasher film. Um, you know, decently acted, shockingly. Um, you know, good, good level of kills and, and some gore and stuff like that. Um, took a different look on Winnie the Pooh because Disney owns like the red t shirt. Uh, and no pants, Winnie the Pooh. Um, so in this one, he wore a f- like a red flannel shirt and jeans. So he's very like workmanlike, which I also can appreciate. They have to differentiate themselves from the you know <laughs> the intellectual property that other people own. So uh, bravo to Winnie the Pooh. Well done. All right, Winnie the Pooh, number fifteen. Uh, my number fifteen is Skin and Rink. I will tell you why this movie makes my list. Let's see. I, first of all, it is incredibly slow and the imagery is incredibly bizarre. It's super static. There's not a lot happening. You don't, it doesn't tell you what's happening with these two kids. They're just in the living room and you don't even know how long they've been in the living room for. It's presumably they've been there for months or years at some point. Um, and after the movie, I was like, I, it stuck with me for about a week. I thought a lot about it. And I was thinking about like my own dreams as a child, as a teenager. I would dream about this uh, trailer, Double Wide, we lived in as a kid. And in my dream, I had to get from my bedroom in the back all the way to my parents room but my parents were trying to like attack me and stop me from doing it and it was this like very foggy sort of weird uh imagery and and i i presumably i'm thinking like these kids are like having their own version of like uh a childhood and something shocking happens and they don't understand it and uh it, it just there's a part where like the kid like cuts himself and, and you just kind of wonder, or it's told to, and, and, you know, the parents are there. I, I know it's experimental. It, it just, I was trying to interpret it as like, it's, it's a, it's something, it's a looking through the world through it, like a child's horrific vision of whatever. Yeah, I, I agree. And the way that it was shot and everything too, was just superb. Uh, like I said, it took like the nineties hand cam style footage to it. And, it's, but, it's, it's but they're all dark. like locked in shots, yeah. Right, but like the the lighting and everything on the setting was unbelievable. Like there are just really dark pieces to a set, and you're like, is something back there? Like, can I see something in there? And that's how dark it is. Where it's like it's it. There's like a TV glow right there at the forefront, but then then in the background, it's so dark that yeah, you and, can't and it's, see. It's scary. Anything. Yeah, it, but it's, it's very like it's terrifying. like. Yeah, and like you said, it takes that look of like a, a child where like everybody can remember, I guess, at least being somewhat afraid of the dark or something or having to get up and go to the bathroom. Oh, in yeah, the yeah, yeah. At night, right? yeah, exactly. And you you open the, the door to the hallway and it's pitch black and, you know, it's just like one of those things as a kid. And I think that this was a nostalgia film in, in that regard, because everybody's kind of had that feeling when they were a kid. And it's like a very eerie throwback to to that kind of time i think for most people and that's what drew people to it um this made in in context a lot of fucking money at the box office it it really did it was made for like 15,000 and i believe it made a couple of 100,000 dollars so mm. that's a win i that's a that's a true win um <clears throat> I, I i did love this movie the only reason it came off of my list was because I'm sure not a lot of people have seen it. Um, now it's on, it's on like fucking Tubi or something. I don't know, but it is available to, out there to watch for free. Uh, and I do highly recommend people do so because it it's an eerie, freaky film, and highly recommend. Yeah, it's like warm and fuzzy and scary. And... Ooh, so are we spoiling on this? Because like, well. On Skin of Marink, I guess you could. I kind of want to talk to you about this. I, I, I don't I, think anybody's going to watch this movie. I think the whole thing happened in the kid's head. Because at the very beginning of the movie, the father's like talking on the phone. 
and it's something about his son hitting his head. Mm. I think he was in the hospital. In a coma? Uh. In a coma, probably, because it said that they were in there for a few years, and then I think he died at the end in a, from a, like being in a coma. That's heavy. Give me, I, I give me, that, I'll that's think just about me. It. Like, yeah. you'd have to go watch it and think about it. But that's my interpretation <clears throat> of how that movie played out. But it was quite okay. good, and it, it opens up questions like that. In my, opinion. I, I, I need to, I need to think about that more. One thing I didn't do is go look at anybody else's opinion of this movie because I just wanted nope. my. Me this is how I interpreted it, and I don't. That is interesting. Um, okay, let's let's go to number fourteen. I think we could talk about that movie a lot more if we oh, wanted we to, could. but. So this is a movie I actually just recently watched. It's called Foe. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen like The Lovely Bones. Um, oh, that's a great movie. So the girl in The Lovely Bones that died Sasha was Ronan. like telling the story. Mm-hmm. She was in this movie. And oh. it's very interesting um, because She's basically – She's an excellent actress. Um, I only really saw her in that as far as I knew. And then I watched this and I started looking at some of the other stuff and she is actually quite a good actress. I was looking at um, some of the movies on her IMDb list and she was excellent in this. Uh, I, I recognize her husband in it, um, but I can't tell you his name or what he was in. I, I definitely recognize him, but ultimately this movie is her husband is being forced to go like, live in like a space station or something like that and work for one year it becomes like mandatory service for people and what they do is they spend like a year somebody spends like a year living with you and like interviewing you and all this other stuff oh i I know what this is they put like a clone of your spouse in the house to live with you who has the same memories and everything so that you aren't alone. It was Mm. very interesting. It it, very well done. Um, Some great scenes, a lot of drama, uh, quite enjoyed it. Highly recommend. It's called Foe. F O E. I can't wait to watch it. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. My number 14 is mission impossible. Dead reckoning part one. Uh, it was, this is one of the four and this is, this is a great action movie. I think what elevated it for me was the, uh, they, they, they did something with AI in a movie that was kind of interesting, which is like the AI is, is a, is a head of the game and no human being can control whatever it's trying to do. And there's some just, there's just some cool fight scenes in it. And I don't know, it's just a cool movie. I I came around on Mission Impossible. Um, I had seen the first one and then kind of not really seen any of the other ones. And this one is on my list. I won't tell you where, but it's on my hmm. list. And yeah, I mean, you nailed it. It's, it's a Mission Impossible movie. Um, they got more into the action, I would think. Uh, if you look at the first one, it was kind of more about like the... Uh, like the sneaking aspect and stuff like that. Whereas now it's, it's definitely a lot more about action, which I appreciate, but they don't, they don't, they never lost the whole, like I'm going to wear a fake skin mask and change right. my voice. Yeah. And, all that. and I love that yeah. part of it because it's, they, oh, yeah. it's ridiculous, but uh, they, it's, they you know, it's based on stuff a, in there. Yeah. It's, it's based on the original TV show and it's, you know, this is Tom Cruise and he just does these and they're, I, I just think they're cool. Um, I'll do them forever. Yeah. He will. That's how he makes his looks, new money. He looks fantastic in this movie. Yeah, he always does. Ageless. All right. Number 13. This made your mentions. Uh, I put Divinity in here. Uh, I mean, holy shit. You. Was that a fucking movie or what? Like You came out of nowhere with this recommendation. You're like, you have to watch this. I'm like, okay, I'll dude, watch it. It was fucking it, wild. It showed up on, on Amazon Prime late in the year and i watched the trailer and i was like what the fuck like it looked 
like a racer head or you know something along those lines like really it's got trippy, a lot of common with those yeah weird and then i saw that mike o'hearn was in it uh who is a meme uh if none of you know who he is he's a he's meme guy. guy yeah he's a meme uh but he's he, in this he's movie. a good actor in this he's he was very good in it um but what a weird film so we have uh what steven dorf in it and uh, there's O'Hearn. some porn there's star like in it, I think. Five or six people in it, really. Um, they, but... they cast a real life porn star in it. Oh, Steven Soderbergh, uh, by the way, is the uh, producer on it. Oh, okay, that makes some sense. He's been known to do some interesting things, <laughs> but the like the whole movie was just weird. Uh, they're like injecting this guy with some serum um, that's supposed to be it diluted. Makes you young, and, yeah, and and like, like you don't fit. age, but your brain does, <laughs> right? And then you, he like you're supposed to stay fit, but they don't dilute his, and they just keep pumping him with it. And eventually, he turns into this giant, muscly, like dickhead, like literally looks like the head of monster a monster guy, but yeah. on a giant monster body. And they get into like a live action anime fight at the end. It was just yeah, all over the place. and that like, beautifully it, all it over was. the place. Oh, I do want to, one thing. I do want to mention is that that it is it. There's a Making a black and white movie isn't as simple as just change color to black and white. And this movie is beautiful. <laughs> like, it really is oh, a yeah. gorgeous movie to That's look a, at. It, it was shot very well. And, you know, you make fun of me because I don't like black and white movies. And this one I probably put on here to shove up your ass because you always tell me I don't like black and white movies. But it was actually just that good. It, it, yeah. It, it was, man. It, it was a shocker, like, out of left field. But I enjoyed it thoroughly. Yeah, and all that old tech stuff, like with all the old, I love that. I'm a sucker for that. Um, speaking of uh, uh, horror, Jason, I, I put uh, on my number thirteen uh, Thanksgiving, which um, if it's is it higher on your list? Than... <laughs> I didn't put it on here. Okay, then let's talk about it really quick. The, I thought this movie was fucking awesome, just because it, it was <clears throat> the kills were so hilarious to me. Like there's this that one oh, part yeah. where like she gets her skin frozen to the to the the mm-hmm. freezer wall and like tears her skin off, and there's the one there's the oven scene where the woman gets baked alive like a turkey, and it's it's basically the plot of Scream. Granted, he, like I know cuts Tim Dillon's guts out with a uh, turkey knife. <laughs> yeah, and the villain is just this like pilgrim guy with a mask on, and it's ridiculous, and it and it's so, I just. I just liked it a lot. Why I thought the it was fun. Fuck was Patrick Dempsey in it? <laughs> like, and he's so good as the uh, <laughs> the the person. I don't know. I don't want to spoil anything, but hey, look. But why was he in it? That like, why not? Come on, dude. He come on. He went from being like sexiest man of the year to fucking. <laughs> hey man, this is like e- Eli Roth. It's an Eli Roth movie. That's fair. Who does it better? I... We yeah, that's fair. We can't really count him out because Eli Roth does some some really good stuff so and i thought it was cool that eli roth did the the thanksgiving trailer for grindhouse so many years ago and now he got to like actually fully flush out dude he doesn't fuck around man he he released that uh that movie clown years ago that literally somebody made it as like a spoof movie and they said it was eli roth and he saw the trailer like they made this trailer for clown and then he went and made the movie like he'll he'll do whatever he wants. He has the leeway to do it because he is good at making these fucking horror movies. Like he's we, a, he's, we, he's up there, dude, with Blumhouse. We, he's up. Yeah, there. we have never. Oh, by the way, nobody's ever done Thanksgiving as a horror movie. Like Thanksgiving is. Uh, what was the Thanksgiving horror movie? Uh, Thanks Killing with uh, the turkey. Fuck off! Yeah, I'm not doing Just that saying. with you. All right. Saying, what's, you said what's your number happened. 12? It did happen. <laughs> okay, well, it's been done well now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Uh, it was actually good. My number 12 is Sound of Freedom, uh, so that okay. made your your honorable mentions. Yeah. Uh, based on a true story, what an incredible movie. Um, again, this was championed by the left as like, these are all lies, but it's not. I mean, this is literally based on a true story, an, an actual person um, who did these things. And... <clears throat> Very well done. Uh, Jim Cazavizel or whatever his Cavizel. fucking name is. It really does not get his due. Um, and bravo for him taking on a movie like this um, because I guess it's 
considered conservative um and hollywood types typically stay away from these movies um, well it also pissed a lot of people off because it made a lot of money at the box office but it was like they were giving away like free tickets it had a lot of controversy around that it doesn't matter it wouldn't stop like it wouldn't it, stop it's, it's one of those movies that just keeps making money like in in spite of itself i mean that's why winnie the pooh 2 is coming out because it it just made money despite itself like it it shouldn't but it did so can i can i mention one scene in that movie that i thought was stood out to me was the scene Certainly. where you know that scene where they're in the hotel room and they're they're making the little kids look kind of like oh yeah sexing them up and everything yeah boy was that that <laughs> was so disturbing that yeah. was uncomfortable uh but that does happen man like that yeah. is how they do it and they really looked into uh like the trafficking part hard uh, you know, they showed these kids like getting, you know, uh, moved around in vans and trucks and like all this other shit. And they showed the coyotes portion of it. And like the one guy pulls up to the border and he's like, well, I'm his uncle. Just ask him. And like that shit does happen. Uh, that is, you know, my buddy from ice tells me like basically all they have to do is say oh well i'm going to see family like an illegal immigrant has to say i'm going to see family um in so and so and turns out their family is a coyote who's just waiting for them on the other side right i, I mean all of this is very real and uh this movie sh like shine the light on that um and i think that's what really made people upset and i think that you were right to point out that if you didn't like this movie and its subject matter, maybe you're the bad guy. <laughs> a thousand percent. <laughs> a thousand percent. If it doesn't make you uncomfortable in all the reasons where it's like, man, we should stop this shit. Um, yeah. Then you're a problem. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, my number 12 was Tetris, which it, I had to go. I had to go way back to remember that this movie came out in 2023 on Apple TV, and um, it, uh, if, if, if Super Mario was the first great video game movie that it's a, a, as an adaptation, Tetris is the first movie that ever was good about a video game because it's, it's kind of like espionage, and it, it, but it nails the, uh, the setting of the time. Like it, it's got like that it, uh, Nintendo's headquarters look exactly like it should. I mean, I happen to know this because I've seen like many photographs of, of that time period. And, uh, you know, the negotiation with the Game Boy and the, es the, the whole like, Russian espionage part of it and getting the Tetris out of the country and the guy never making any money from it. Uh, he would eventually make money from it. And then there was this whole uh, uh, he's trying to sell it to some shithead in Germany. And and uh, it's just a really interesting, fun movie about the greatest one of the greatest video games of all time and how it was created, which was just this poor bastard in the Soviet Union just wanted to have some fun. I'm a huge Tetris fan. Uh, absolutely love that game. So I'm I'm right there with you. I did watch this, and Taron Egerton is uh, a gem. You know, I, yeah. I don't think a lot of people really give him his due. Um, He's been in not, so many bad know. movies. He was, he was Elton John in the biopic um, yeah. of him, and um, you know, I. I like Taron Egerton. I thought this movie was was done pretty well. Yeah, this movie's just fucking cool, and it just made me happy because I, like I said, I love video games. I more of this, please. Yeah. Uh, number eleven on my list. Uh, this I'm sure has to be somewhere on your list is <laughs> Sisu. <laughs> Sisu. So this was John Wick Light, uh, World War Two John Wick style. Uh, some very clever clever kills in oh here my God. Uh, i mean for <laughs> oh. for what it is uh a lot of impossibilities out there just like john wick but um what a fun watch i mean this was very very good enjoyable he's he does not speak uh hardly at all throughout the whole movie um but he's he's out there killing nazis with shovels and shit so what more do you want the one once the horse blows up, you go like, "Oh, this is the kind of movie this is going <laughs> to yeah. be." Oh yeah. Uh, also, it, but it's also just a, a beautiful movie too. Like I don't know where they shot it. I think I looked into this, but I forgot. Uh, like the landscapes and everything were just really gorgeous. Like lots of bright colors and muddy and 
and fucking just the kills are oh my god i mean just so good how does a movie like that even get picked up into like main movie culture who knows but i'm glad it did because it's like you would think oh well i've seen all these john wick movies what makes this one different it is bitch go watch it yeah it's fucking cool um my number 11 is one that uh it's kind of out of left field. I watched this. It's called Beyond Utopia. It's a documentary, and it was shot right before COVID happened, like right before. And um, <clears throat> I don't know why this. I don't know why the documentary decided, chose this subject, but through a bunch of coincidences, there was a family. I, maybe they were trying to. They were trying to show defectors from North Korea. Well, there's a family in this movie, and they're. They are on film outside the border of North Korea in China, and they they uh, call this pastor, and they and he helps people get out of North Korea and and into South Korea, and so uh, there's like these little places on the border of North Korea where the the Chinese government doesn't doesn't like search, and there's it's a whole family like mom, dad, grandma, uh, kid. Um, and, and they're they're asking this pastor for help. So he flies. He's an older guy now, but he flies out. He gets people. There's they're called. What do they call them? They're not contacts, but they're they're brokers. And so they get a broker with this family, and the whole the, their whole journey from the border of North Korea all the way to South Korea is documented. It's all filmed. And so they go from China down to Vietnam, and then they they go into Cambodia, and then they cross through the jungle of Cambodia into Laos. And then once they get from Laos, they go straight to Thailand. And if and apparently, if you tell the Thai the Thailand authorities that you're trying to get to South Korea, they'll they will deport you. You're safe basically, and they'll deport you to South Korea, where South Koreans will like reintegrate you into society and give you job and housing and all that. And it just, it follows their journey, and it was really sad, but it was it was crazy. It was really interesting. So yeah, it's interesting to see that I did not see this. I don't watch a ton of documentaries for better or worse. Uh, but it's like that Yanmi Park um, girl that was on Joe Rogan's mm-hmm. podcast a while ago. Like she defected and, and escaped from North Korea. And she talked, I mean, almost exactly about, you know, what you were just mentioning. So it makes sense. Um, I just don't get into a lot of documentaries. Uh, that's your style for sure. Not really mine. Well, I watch a lot of them. This one was the one that stood out to me the most this year. So yeah, number ten, sir. Number ten on my list. Uh, Bo is afraid. <laughs> I'm sure this one's somewhere on your list. Uh, probably higher than mine. Uh, um, what a what a film! What a film! I quite enjoyed I, this I don't, one. What could, I I don't I could not recommend this movie to literally anybody else. Like, it is <laughs> impenetrably weird. If it's further down your list, I'll save uh, for what I have to say it is. for it. Okay. All right. Um, my number 10 is the, uh, I think the only animated movie on my list and you're going to kill me. You're going to hate me for this. It's fine. I'll take the heat. Um, Spider-Man across the spider verse. Uh, look, it was a fucking great movie. It was really surprising. Um, the first one was good too, but what's interesting is that you guys, like we, we talk about multiverse movies. We're always like, I hate the multiverse. That's so stupid. In this movie, it's about them trying to get rid of the, the multiverse. So there's like, there's like five or six different Spider-Man who are like, we got to stop the multiverse. Like this is out of control. We got to knock it off. And so it, it not only incorporates like different versions of Spider-Man, including live action ones, but um, it's got like a, uh, uh, like every animation style is different for each character. So you get like one, one animation style is like, cgi and then one might be like a different sort of like hand-drawn look and then one of them is just like no it's just like frames of a thing and and um there's one that's like a lego and uh you know and there are all these like different spider-men and and anyway i i don't want to get into like the it's kind of a it's a complicated second part of a three-part series so the third movie i think comes out this year um but it, it was really good and it's it's um it's fresh like the villain isn't a villain from you would know from like Spider-Man. It's like something completely different. 
and the villain ends up like breaking a bunch of shit and and they're all trying to fix it and then uh, miles morales is kind of like the main character but um at the end it ends on a cliffhanger that's very similar to the matrix reloaded where uh uh agent smith gets out of the matrix he's inside the head of that guy and he's with neo on the on the you know and that's the big reveal at the end of that movie and this movie had a similar sort of like oh shit like it's a really interesting cliffhanger and it doesn't hold back uh it's not it's not a kid's movie uh per se it's very adult it's got a lot of adult themes in it that um about like i don't know people dying on the job as a police officer in new york and stuff like that so well, just remember you can't be spider-man if there's multiple <laughs> okay <clears throat> number nine all right you knew this one was coming all year you wondered how high this would be on my list oh it is evil dead rise I, that's actually a disappointment to you because i'm willing to bet you thought that this was number one for me i thought um, it would be top five <laughs> evil dead rise i put on i this watched list, it too but uh do you have this on your list at all nope okay so this was a really good, fresh take on a movie that you say they've done seven times, um, which is not true. This uh, is the second best Evil Dead movie. Yes, Evil Dead 2 was be the best. Uh, and no, then, uh, Army of Darkness was the best. Well, so I would go Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness, and then Evil Dead Rise, for sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Some people don't consider Army of Darkness an Evil Dead movie because it's not in the name, uh, but it is same characters. Uh, I I love this. It was bloody, good, gory. I mean, it had all the it callbacks. had a lot of gore. Yeah, it had a lot of gore. Uh, it had all the callbacks um, to the original movies. I like the fresh take on the Necronomicon itself. Uh, you know, the new look of it actually was like pretty interesting and cool. Um, compared to some of the other ones that, you know, like in the Evil Dead remake, uh, the Necronomicon mm. looked kind of whack. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, obviously it didn't have Ash in it. Uh, you know, Bruce Campbell is done playing Ash as far as we know. Um, but he was part of this very much so. Uh, I I enjoyed it. And I, I know, I think Fetty Alvarez is the guy that directed it or something. Um, he's there's plans for more of these, so I'm I'm excited by that. I thought the storytelling in it was actually really cool. Um, <clears throat> that basically they sh show like an ending before they show the movie, um, but they show it as the beginning, which is really neat. Um, yeah, I I really enjoyed this this take on it. It was again like just very good they do some weird shit as always uh like in the evil dead remake the girl like cut her tongue in half with a or the guy cut girl cut her tongue in half with something the guy cut his arm off with a turkey electric knife or whatever you know they do some shit like that uh, but this time they like grate a girl's leg with a cheese grater you know yeah. i i love <laughs> there's some good like gore yeah. there's some like, really like good too. gore and stuff like that so uh evil dead rise made my list at number nine cool um okay so we're kind of getting into the territory now where we probably are gonna have duplicate movies but they might be arranged differently so if this is higher on your list let me know and we'll just talk about it when you get to it uh my number nine is the covenant yes higher on my list okay we, we'll talk about it when we get to you i know this is on your list but i'm not sure where number eight infinity pool hmm Oh, you don't even have that on your list. Wow. I Look forgot about it. So, wow. Infinity Pool, what a mind fuck of a movie. It was very interesting. Especially you you were really big into like watching Maxine and Pearl and I, like those you know movies. I, I completely I can't believe, can't, I, can't believe I forgot one. about it. Yeah, I forgot to write it down. It would be on my list, absolutely. I Alexander love this movie so Skarsgård fucking much. is one of the He's most so underrated good. guys in Hollywood. I mean, and we had the Northmen last the North year. Yep. You know, we had uh, we had Infinity Pool this year. He does so much other stuff, and Bill Skarsgård as well is you know who was Pennywise and everything. Who's going to be in Nosferatu that's coming out this year? Oh. Um, I mean, he's going to be good in that too. 
Um, we got to talk about the great, uh, the great uh, Brandon Cronenberg, uh, who yeah. just man, this movie is gorgeous. I I have got to tell you, I am so bummed out that I forgot about it. Didn't this. even make your honorable mentions. You totally yeah. forgot this movie even came out this year. I did, yeah. Um, Mia Goth is one of my favorite actresses working right now, and she is so fucking unhinged in this movie. It's yeah, hilarious. She's and, really good at this genre, like yeah, this horror like, genre. She is so good at it. And this was just a mind fuck of a movie, um, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was quite yeah, good. Yeah, me too. And by the end, you're like, I'm not sure if I knew. It's like you, you nothing's really addressed completely. And I love that part yeah. of it too. I love I love movies that really just don't give you any satisfaction. I, yeah, I I love it when people leave disappointed. Um because yeah, I would, that's like yeah, every the, movie I ever experience really, there's I leave on some level of disappointment. Um like even like Winnie the Pooh, I wanted to hear like a who 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 or something from him, you hmm. know, or uh one of his songs, but they chose to not have him talk in it for whatever reason and I get it, but like come on. So if I redo my list, I would probably have this one pretty high up. But you can't. So what's your I can't. eight? Man, that sucks. Um, my eight is Sisu. Yeah. Sisu is just great. What a good <laughs> film, man. What a good just... film. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's fucking great. Yeah, I enjoyed that. All right. Number seven for me was John Wick 4. Uh, okay. I can't even believe it didn't make your top 15. I thought that... Obviously, it was a little ridiculous, and I agree it was not as good as any of the first three. Um, but they did some cool shit in there, man. I mean, they expanded yeah. out the world itself a lot more by adding in like the trackers and you know different um, different people that work in the underground. Um, but also using the dragon's breath shotgun rounds. Oh yeah, and when he's <laughs> in the house that. and he's just blasting people with this dragon's breath shotgun. And the fact that they did this, like, overhead, um, like, camera angle where it almost looks like you're playing, like, an old, um, I think, uh, like, Zombies Ate My Neighbors was kind of like that. You know what I mean? Like, it, the style that that was shot in was just incredible. Um, it was one of my favorite parts of that movie. I thought it was, was great. But it's like an overhead side scrolling type you know, video game almost. And I thought incorporating that into the film was pretty good. So um, there is a, there's a video game called hotline Miami, which came out a few years ago. And uh, it is basically this, this scene, like what you're describing, which is, it's so similar that they asked the director if he had played hotline Miami and he had not. So just by coincidence, oh, wow. uh, hotline, Ma yeah, hotline Miami is just like a super violent running around the, from a top-down view, blasting people with guns and shit. So, uh, yeah, I I didn't look. John Wick is cool, and I like that it they they still make them. But I, when you say it's expanded out the universe, I don't know that I love the way they're expanding out the universe. Well, I didn't get into the Continental. I tried um, the show on Peacock. I didn't care for it. I couldn't even really stomach the first episode. Uh, it just didn't. <laughs> entertain me in any in any capacity uh i think ballerina comes out this year which is a spinoff of john don't know Wick. if i want that yeah. um yeah i mean we'll see i it's i like i like what they did by expanding the universe but the problem is if they expand the universe and then don't do anything good with it then what was the point um and that's where we're at with it right now and i'm just hoping that it. the expanded that universe up. does does good things <clears throat> um all right my number seven is a movie that uh i i know you haven't seen um it's called a fire it is about a writer who goes with his with his art friend or whatever uh i i, f I think this takes place in australia if i'm not but i'm not sure um and they they go to this uh, house that's out kind of by the beach, and he's there to write his great book, and his friend's there to do his great art work. Um, but the friend is really interested in just kind of like hanging out for the summer, and the writer guy is like, "I gotta write this book. I gotta write it." 
And so he's like against having any sort of fun or whatever. Uh, it's set on the backdrop of a forest fire that's happening. Um, hence the name of fire. And um, uh, th there's a, a, a coast guard and a woman from the town. And they both, the woman is staying with the two guys. And then the coast guard guy ends up, I don't know, hanging out. The, he becomes romantically involved with the art kid or whatever. Well, what's interesting about the movie is that the guy who's writing the book is a fucking prick the entire way through. He is so like insufferable. And then, and then um, his publisher comes to read the book finally. And it's, and uh, before the publisher comes, the, the woman who he has like a very low opinion of, he thinks like, she's just this like worthless woman. Uh, she reads it and she thinks it's terrible. And he's like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just some, you know, woman or whatever. So then the, the publisher comes down and uh, the publisher reads it. It's terrible. The book is terrible. And then it's at this point that uh, the woman reveals that she's actually like a writer herself. And she uh, has like a PhD or whatever. And that he had just underestimated. He like completely blocked off her ability to have any sort of like opinion on it. And uh, the film culminates with these two, the two gay guys burning alive in a car in the forest fire um and so he loses his friend and then um boy that took a turn yeah it gets it gets really dark at the end um and then he goes to the hospital because the one the publisher guy who's still there with them the, falls ill um and then he uh he says well i'll i'll see you around and she ultimately would find out the publisher would tell her but not him that he was dying of cancer and the guy was so selfish he never even bothered to ask about it um and yeah he at the end realizes that he had been the biggest piece of shit he could have possibly been the entire summer and in the end he lost like everything and it's it's not a great it's not a happy ending for the Sounds movie depressing i like it. it it was pretty depressing and uh and he i think he ends up writing the book about that summer but he changes her name or whatever and then it's unclear if he and her get together after that or not because they had sort of like a maybe a relationship, but it's unclear. So it was a really good movie, though. I really enjoyed nice. it. All right. My number six movie we kind of discussed, so we don't have to stay around on this one. Mission Impossible. Cool. Enjoyed it. Loved um, it. Yeah. I, I love the Dutch camera angles that he uses in that movie. Um, There's a fight scene in an alleyway that was like so cool. I was like, I don't even know how they filmed this because it's so claustrophobic. It's. You know, it's like a three foot wide alleyway. Well, the whole driving scene when he's in like that little Fiat. Or... <laughs> I yeah, it's great. Uh, yeah, when they it's... do, yeah, they they're when they show the movie trailer, they show him jumping off the cliff. I get it; it's real. He did that. But man, all the all the car stuff they do in these movies is always so cool. Yeah, good good film. Uh, what are we on number six? Yep. Okay, my uh, number number six six is a uh, Bo is afraid. So. Man, this movie is fucking wild, dude. This movie is crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's three acts. The first act is like, I didn't even know. How would you even describe it? Like a fever dream? I thought the whole movie was kind of like a fever oh, dream. Like It's crazy, this, dude. This movie is very, it's difficult to talk about in the sense that like, you're not going to understand what we're saying until you watch it. Like, yeah, it's all over the place. It's wild it's artful it's well shot i mean there's a lot of like random naked people and shit and like weird stuff happening i mean just an all over the place kind of movie um but i enjoyed it i i really did um we should mention that ari aster's the director he directed midsummer and hereditary yeah so those are two of my like i love hereditary <laughs> the difference is that this was shot this isn't in a horror movie. It, it's shot in a very different way. Yeah, uh, from any of his other other movies like Midsummer and and um, what was the other one? Hereditary were definitely shot more like linear in in that regard. Whereas this one kind of moves around a little bit, and you're not always sure exactly what is happening um, or why any of this is happening. Uh, but he like seems to live in like a very dystopian world. Um, that like he's like he leaves his real. apartment yeah yeah he leaves his apartment and then 
he goes out to do something and he has to run back to his apartment as fast as possible because there's like a guy that's trying to kill him. He had to like go like, visit his mom. Yeah, that movie's about him visiting his mom. So the movie's about mom issues. He's he's got Walking Phoenix has mommy issues. But the first act is him in this like town trying to get ready to leave to go see his mom. And it's like you don't nothing is explained. You don't know why the world is so chaotic. It's just fucking chaotic. It's so strange. Um and then he ends up in the f- well, no, he ends up in that family's house, and then they get him high on drugs, and then he ends up in the forest, and there's a play happening in the forest, and he becomes part of the play, which is the second act, and the second it's about like him growing up and growing old, but it's yeah, like plays about him. Yeah, it's about <laughs> him, and it's so it's so like visually bizarre. Yeah. And the, then and, he find, and the ending will teach you nothing. Like oh, the ending, the ending, the, the whole movie part. <laughs> just gets you nowhere. Like it doesn't it's one get of, you it's anywhere. One of those. And so if you're looking for definitive answers or story, don't watch this movie because you're not going to get it. At after after the play's over, uh, he's in the play about his life. He's also in the crowd, the audience watching the play, and he ends up like meeting his two kids or something. But then, yeah, at the end of the movie, uh, he's in a he's in like an uh, what would you even call it? Like a stadium. And it's like it's like a giant pool of water or something. And he's like being judged by his mom. Yeah. And it's like it's so it's on my list because it's just so fucking interesting. It's weird. And it, it's a weird it, ass movie. It's a weird ass movie. I think people need to get out there and, and check this one out. Yeah, it's not boring. I tell you that it's not no, boring it's not. at all. Uh, okay, you're number five. This one I know is not on your list because uh, I also don't know how you feel about the original series, uh, the new Hunger Games movie. Oh, this movie was fucking incredible, dude! Like it was really good. Uh, What's it so, called? The Ballad of Whatever. The, uh, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, or something like that. Um, so this one is a prequel to the original series uh, that actually examines how the president, who is the bad guy throughout the series, uh, becomes the president and like a game maker and stuff like that for the Hunger Games. And I, I mean, dude, it was acted very well. Um there's a uh, the girl, the main girl in it. Um, she sings a lot. It's obviously like kind of her thing. Uh, she sings very well in it. I believe her name is Rachel Zegler. I think she did all um, the the songs for it. Yeah, she's um, incredibly unpopular. She's in that new Snow White movie. Oh, is that her? Yeah, that's a shame because she was actually really good in it. I mean, it's a shame that she's kind of taken Snow White to like this next level. But it's Disney. What do you expect? And I, I don't know, man. It just because I've seen the the original series too. Like I kept stopping and like looking at the differences between how they treated the participants uh, in this one versus the next one. And basically, you see how the Hunger Games became what it was in the original series based off of this one, because this one is the tenth Hunger Games, and then the the first one is the 74th hunger games so you're spanning it like once a year you're spanning like 60 years basically and how the games have evolved because of the president um but it's like he's a student at the time in the capital and he just goes and and a lot of stuff happens uh he is kind of like against the hunger games he falls in love with the girl that's in the hunger games and he's trying to help her win and stuff so uh it's very interesting too because there's some of the songs that you heard from the original i mean it was it was done very well and i i was not uh the biggest fan of the original series i thought they were fine uh this one i would actually say is probably the best in the entire series of hunger games movies Wow, high praise from you on that one. Dude, That's I, I very surprising. Can, I've said to my wife on numerous occasions that that movie was incredible. It was, it huh. was shot very well. They do different things in it. I, I mean, it was just good. Wow. Okay, uh, on to my number five, uh, <clears throat> which is Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, Didn't get to watch what, it. What? Uh, 
this movie where to begin so i guess when they adapted it from the book they scorsese and dicaprio were trying to figure out how to make it and i guess they decided that they wanted to make the movie about a character in the book who's a minor character and expanded flushed him out to the to be in like the the, the arc of the story um I don't want to spoil a lot of this for you. Not that a lot happens, but apparently the Osage Indians uh, in the uh, 20s were, were sort of like the wealthiest people per capita in America because they had so much oil on the on the uh, reservation. And so these white guys were moving in and they were marrying the female females of the tribe and then the the women were mysteriously starting to die from from like either by murder or by poison or by right. like a whole matter of things and so the osage indians went to washington dc and calvin coolidge was president at the time and he met with them and he said look we'll get the what is now the fbi we'll we'll get them to go look at it and see what's going on because they felt like they're like these murders are happening and the local police aren't doing anything about it um and so it, the movie Leonardo DiCaprio is a, a fucking idiot in the movie. He plays a moron. And so you're spending three and a half hours with like this idiot and not everybody's a big fan of that, but the, it's not a movie about him. It's about like the whole, the whole right. big picture, but there's this, uh, this woman in it and she is, uh, goodness gracious. I don't know how to say this on screen. She's like a magnet the way she talks and the way she acts. And I don't know if that's really her personality in real life. It seems like it might be because she's definitely not doing a, it's a deliberate way she's doing something, but it, she's like dynamic when you're watching her and Robert De Niro, this might be like one of his best movies ever. He is like this conniving evil man, but he speaks fluent Osage or whatever the, the dialect is. And, and he, it's just like an amazing performance by him. Yeah, and, I'm looking forward to watching this one for sure when it comes out on Apple TV, uh, especially now that, you know, obviously we're already doing our list. I'm not inclined to pay to watch it. Um, also, I want to mention the soundtrack is like it's a very important part of that movie because it, it's like a low rhythm, like da, 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 da. and it, it makes you it makes you uncomfortable because it, it makes you think something bad is going to happen, even if it doesn't. And the, the soundtrack just plays into that. It's so subtle and interesting. I, I, I'm excited for you to watch it. All righty. Number four. This was already brought up on your list. The Covenant. Oh, let's talk about The Fucking Covenant, man. This movie's awesome. <laughs> Guy Ritchie just fucking crushing it. I mean, this was... Jake Gyllenhaal going into like Afghanistan to save an interpreter um, that saved his ass. I, I mean, this movie, the, was... the whole first half of the movie with him saving his ass, by the way, insane it is so cool. Oh my God. I, they did everything in this movie. It, it was it, like, Oh, just such a smart movie. Like it was done so well acted expertly like jake oh, yeah. and what's kind and, uh, of guy. funny i never even fucking knew that this movie was coming out it, dude it showed up on amazon prime and i'm like what the fuck is this and i watched the trailer and i'm like oh my god it's guy Ritchie, jake gyllenhaal like why wasn't there more behind this movie uh yeah like, <clears throat> it should have been marketed better like it was an incredible film but i feel like I like I don't even know what it earned box office wise, but like it should have done well, and I I don't think it did. But God, what a what a movie! Like I I watched it twice in the span of like two days because it was that damn good. Like I just thoroughly enjoyed it and plan on watching it again. The budget was fifty five million. The box office was twenty one point eight. That's what? tragic. That is That's tragic. tragic. How how is that even possible? <clears throat> This movie was phenomenal. It had I, explosions. It had guns. It had the fucking action everything. scenes were crazy. Like, and it's I, Guy I Ritchie. You, Who the fuck? Like I, it's a Guy I, Ritchie <laughs> movie. Come on. They even it's even called Guy Ritchie's The Covenant. Believe it or not, 
I, I don't know why this movie I don't know why this movie didn't hit with people because I I rarely like movies like this like the just the action movie in the Middle East kind of thing like it's kind of tiresome to me it was so good and it was like I, I even went and looked up how they where they shot it how it was filmed like I was like I was so into this movie it was great oh my god I they they nailed this movie without a doubt in my mind they nailed this movie the AC 130 scene with uh, oh, yeah. you know, uh just all that shit oh quality oh, I'm stuff. getting goosebumps thinking about it, dude <laughs> all right <clears throat> uh my number four was uh inside with willem dafoe wow <laughs> yeah <clears throat> i you fucking that love that this movie? movie yeah holy shit <clears throat> the premise of this movie is that he is like a thief and he breaks into a guy's apartment and he gets stuck in the apartment and the temperature change fluctuates and he's in there for like a year I just like the concept of it was so fucking weird and it was so interesting. And like, I mean, Willem Dafoe really doesn't talk much in the movie because there's not really much to talk about. He's just, he's by himself. It's like, yeah. And it's, he's locked in this apartment and it's like, Oh, the temperature went up and it goes like way up. And he's like, fucking, he's like dying of heat. And then it's like that for a little bit. And then the temperature changes to like freezing and he's like freezing. And you're just like, what would I do in this situation? Nobody can hear him on the outside. The door is completely sealed. It's soundproof. He can't get in. He can't get up through the ceiling. He can't get through the walls. Like all, the, It's like fucking sealed in. And he's got windows and he can see out in the city, but he's stuck. He's trapped in there. And I was like, oh, I was like, what would I do in that situation? And that's why I kind of loved it. It's just weird because this is one of those movies where nothing happens. But nothing happens. But like in a good way. Like I don't. It's it's hard to explain. But ultimately, nothing happens. No, I I just I he, we stack it up. He's making like that pyramid of shit. And he's trying to climb up. But I'm like, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, what, what, what would I do? What would I do in that situation? Well, because you, you could you fall and fucking break, break your back. Your neck. And, yeah, yeah, and you're dead. Or like, wow. what do you eat? Or how do you drink? Or what do you do? Uh, you you have a TV. You know what? What like what can you watch? Um, do you get bored or are, are you, can you like, how do you keep warm if there's no like clothes and how do you, it's just a fucking weird movie that I loved. Anyway. My number three is one I don't think you watched. Definitely not on your list is God is a bullet. I, I didn't watch it. You recommended it to me. I'm a bad boy. This movie to me was incredible. Um, it has the guy who played Jamie on Game of Thrones. Uh, Jamie yeah. Foxx is in it for small periods. I know you don't like Jamie Foxx. Um, the girl that's in it, I believe, was in the green room. I believe she was like the skinhead girl in the green room, um, which is a phenomenal movie. If nobody's seen that, go watch that. Uh, very very good um yeah I, dude this had a lot of stuff that like some just good gunfights like it's kind of crazy out there like about a cult and you see some like weird uncomfortable shit um this guy's jaw gets blown off with a shotgun spoiler alert <laughs> uh it's i mean these guys are injecting a snake with like crystal meth. It's got everything that you could want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> so Nikolai Walter Custo gets some very unnecessary tattoos for no reason. I mean, like it's, it's got it all. Okay. Well, uh, my number three is talk to me. You got this one on your list. It is. Okay. We'll talk about it when we get to you. My number two, which I know is on your list, Oppenheimer. It's okay. We'll talk about that one. Okay, later that then. one's number one on your list. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. My number two is one that I don't think you saw, and I really think you should see it if you haven't. Anybody within anybody within the sound of my voice, please go watch this fucking movie because it is so goddamn good. Uh, it's uh, Blackberry. It's about the making of the company BlackBerry. It's got um, Jay Barishaw plays like the the sort of the engineer of the hardware, and Glenn Howerton from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia plays like the hard nosed businessman. This movie is so fucking entertaining. It is so much fun to watch. It just it just flies. You're just like bam, 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 bam. You're learning that you know they were they were trying to make the device and then they couldn't get the device right. And then Glenn Howerton was like was like he didn't want he wasn't interested in it but then he needed a new job so he's like oh i'll help you guys get your thing off the ground and then it just shows like how 
the company was like mismanaged. They somehow still made the products that they made, BlackBerry, the company, and then it still was mismanaged. And uh, even to this day, I don't, I don't really know like what BlackBerry does now. But um, there, Glenn, if there was any justice in the world, Glenn Howerton would get an Oscar nomination for his role in this movie because he is so fucking good. And it, it's a funny movie, and it's just it's fantastic. I cannot, I cannot recommend it enough. Fair enough. Okay. My number one was right. <laughs> Talk to Me. This movie that, this was movie, so fucking uh, good. It was so good. I, I don't care that it's a horror movie at number one. Like, that's obviously, you know, in my heart, horror movies are the best kinds of movies. But this one was done so fucking well. I think this movie, it, for whatever reason, horror movies they rarely ever do something do different and new. And this one did something completely fresh that it was like, I blew my mind. The concept yeah. of it. Like, also, okay, so you've got this little like, hand in New Zealand. I think it was New Zealand or Australia. Um, movies that have <clears throat> leads from those countries don't typically do well. The directors knew that, but were very adamant about um using all like new zealand or australian actors and knowing that like their movie might not do well and it did do well I, because it was done so well the movie itself was was i mean perfect like the storytelling in it was great the acting in it was great the special effects makeup was unbelievable oh there's some cool shit in that there's movie. some really cool the gore stuff was in really good movie. i i mean what more can you really want from a movie? Um, the directors, because there's two of them, did go on Joe Rogan. He had them on. Uh, and I find them to be actually very irritating. Like, I I don't like them. Mm -hmm. uh, I find them to be annoying. But it was cool to hear that they used to do, like, their own stunts and stuff like that. So they kind of, you know, have an idea of, like, you know, movie making and stuff. And then they turned around and made this. And it was it blew me away as far as a horror movie goes, like absolutely blew me away. It was original. Um, it was timed well, you know, it wasn't a three hour long movie. Um, and, but they used every, every minute of that movie. Well, yeah, it, it also was a new take on, um, they used the, uh, smartphone in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so it's like they're live streaming, these things happening and there's like this hand and you, you, you tell the hand to talk to you and then something possesses you and um, they're treating it almost like, like a drug, like they're, they're taking yep. a drug and yep. then they're like experiencing the, and, and that's true. I thought it was so interesting that they were like, they would do that. And then um, the ending was so brilliant. Oh fuck! I was yeah. like, oh, I was like, oh, and and like for obviously this is going to be like a franchise, I think, because uh, they could tell these kind of stories like endlessly. But that just that ending, it was so clever and well done. Oh, what a great movie! Yeah, I I mean that's why for me it made movie of the year. I know we're about to talk about Oppenheimer, um, but I think this <clears throat> one had to take the cake because Christopher Nolan's going to release what he does uh, time after time after time. And it obviously had a dynamite cast and everybody was in this movie, literally everybody. Um, so for talk to me to do it with a bunch of nobodies, I think that really takes special credit in my opinion. And that's why it's on my number three of the year as well. Cause it's just, it's just great. All right, let's do it. Uh, number one, number one Oppenheimer. Look, I, uh, I thought long and hard about, how I would arrange these movies. Obviously I left off infinity pool. I, I didn't on accident. I never had a doubt in my mind that Oppenheimer was one of the best movies of the decade or the century. Um, I, I was worried about that because I, I walked into the movie knowing I would love it. And then I walked out of it and I was, I couldn't really talk about it with anybody because nobody had seen it. And I was afraid of being hyperbolic about it because I felt like it was like it was like uh, Christopher Nolan's magnum opus. It was like the greatest film he's ever made. You know, like the guy's made so many amazing movies. 
Um, the the cast in this movie, like it's still like, Killian Murphy's best role. I think he would well very much deserve the Oscar for it. Um, Emily Blunt should get an Oscar nomination for her role in it. Uh, Matt Damon is incredible in this movie. Yep. Um, yeah, oh yeah. Robert Downey Jr. is incredible in this movie. He was, yeah, he was especially oh, he was good so in this. good. And I've, I mean, I've been a, an RDJ fan for a long time. Um, you know, and some of the he chooses really weird roles, but like even in Tropic Thunder. Like, which is not a movie that anybody should necessarily be um, revered for their acting in. He was He's, like he should have been. Like he got was, nominated for it. Yeah, I mean, because it was he was that good, and he was that good. He is just that good. Um, I I think you're spot on with this one. Um, for me, talk to me just took that number one spot because it was unique and you're right. Like I go into a Nolan movie knowing I'm going to probably love it. So I feel like there's a level of bias there um, because I couldn't tell you a bad movie that he's made. He so I, I, I maybe tenant. Um, okay. I'm not, I'm not done talking about Oppenheimer. I, I got more to say, look, I am not a fan of Robert Oppenheimer. I never have been. I love history. I, I love World War II. Um, I don't like that guy at all. Partly, I'm glad the movie didn't really make him the hero. He's not the hero. First of all, he did. He was a part of something bigger than himself, but he always thought of himself as the the guy. And and there, that that level of arrogance really bothers me. And then his whole like uh, guilt about it. He like his internal guilt always pissed me off because it was either us or the Nazis, the Nazis were going to get it, or it was going to be the Russians that got it. And we got it and we did it. It was hard. And then we used it and he didn't like that. We used it. And then we used it again because it didn't, because it, it, they didn't want to surrender. And it was these, it was these decisions we made along the way, which is like, okay, we're either going to lose millions of troops in mainland Japan in, during an invasion, or we're going to drop a bomb. That's going to kill a hundred thousand people. Those are your options. That's it. Um, and I and I like that he wasn't a sympathetic figure. And I think uh, the source material Robert uh, that uh, Christopher Nolan pulled this from is pretty sympathetic to uh, Oppenheimer in, in the sense that they don't really think he was a communist. Robert Oppenheimer was a communist. I'm sorry, he just was. And um, I think that was like the only flaw with the movie. Oh, and the, the depiction of Harry Truman was kind of weird, but. Um, a, a lot of that movie, like the spoilers that I was mentioning was like Casey Affleck is in it for like five minutes and he is like the best part of that movie. Like, it's so good. Um, I love the, the, the time jumping. Um, I love the build up to the bomb. I loved the explosion of the bomb. Oh, and yeah. then it's like, definitely, it was, I saw it in the theater. So it was like, boom. And you're like, holy shit, man. That was like fucking cool. And then there's a lot of other stuff. There's the. You know, Robert Downey Jr. is trying to like ruin Oppenheimer's uh, career, and that that, in my opinion, Robert Downey Jr.'s character is actually the hero of the movie, not Oppenheimer. But the they don't really, in real life, I would have said Robert that Robert Downey Jr.'s character was the hero. See, in my um, my opinion, a movie like this doesn't have or necessarily need a hero. Like it's just a historical context. Um, oh, but I, but I, but I do look at it that way because I don't like Robert Oppenheimer. <laughs> like to well, me, he's yeah. the bad guy. Um, I mean, the I would say the part I didn't like um, is the very end when he's like talking to um, Albert Einstein, Einstein or whatever, yeah, and he's like, you know, yeah. we thought that we could ignite the world and like blow it up, and then it cuts to this like scene of a darkened earth that's starting to like burn and shit and it's like come on come on just, i get it uh just didn't need that heavy-handed just yeah. didn't need that it, it was just and, unnecessary to end the movie that way in my opinion and i and, and that the whole like oh we have to tell we have to say what the whisper what they whispered what was it that made robert downey jr go crazy and, and have such vindicate like um you know, hate this guy so much. And it was like, mm, didn't work for me. But um, I just, uh, that whole scene in the middle, and, I, you know, I don't know, man. I just, I, I just the people that show up like, in this movie. What's Christopher Nolan going to do next? 
Well, you know, and this is interesting because he he did something completely different for this movie. Like he does this every single time. This movie, he wrote the whole script in first person. Like he he does things that are like it's like why did you do that? And you know, I I don't know what he's gonna do next. But he made, in my opinion, this is the perfect companion piece to Dunkirk. They're both World War II movies, and they're both telling a really important story of something that happened. And um, this movie was produced for a hundred million dollars and it made nine hundred and fifty five million dollars. You can make a movie that's not a fucking brand or a comic book or a toy and you can make a movie for grown ups that's long. It's three hours long and it can be a success. And to me, that is the most important aspect of the entire fucking I, thing. I agree a hundred percent because more of this, please. <clears throat> look at these stupid inflated budgets for like these Marvel films. They're ridiculously high. Um in this case, he doesn't need to do that. I mean, all the people are in his movies, and you still only made it for a hundred million. Like with as much effects and stuff as you had to put in it. Like, I mean, come on, that's that's ridiculous. And it's because people want to be in his movies. Matt Damon, I think, was saying in an interview, his wife wanted him to like take a break for a little bit, and so he was like, "Okay, I'll take a break." Unless Christopher Nolan calls, and then like I'm doing Christopher it. Nolan calls, and she was like, "Okay," and then Christopher Nolan calls, and oh, we've got the perfect part for you, and it damn well was, and he acted his ass off. I mean, Matt Damon. I, I told you guys, a gem. He's I, I he's told, great. It, it, in my opinion, I was like, "There's there's like four Oscar worthy performances that are like I'm sure they'll get nominated." There's probably like eight in this movie total if you really yeah. thought about it. Like there, there's that whole scene where they're around the table and they're discussing. It's in the black and white. Robert Downey Jr. is there. They're um and they're all kind of like talking about uh the they're they're chewing the meat. They're like the, they're men in the room doing the work. Right. And it's just like fuck, man. It's so goddamn good. I, I think uh, we can all just agree that if Christopher Nolan calls, you answer the fucking phone. I, and and Christopher you're Nolan doing whatever it is that he wants you to do. That's it. I mean, and, and that was simple. that wasn't. It's not just a meme. Like dudes go, they will get up and go to see a, a, a one of his movies. And and I I did the same thing. I I kind of regret not seeing that one in theaters. I I wish I had, um, but that's okay. Like I mean, I have a big screen TV at home. It's fine. Um, I would have liked to see it for the the better sound and and everything and in IMAX, but. Yeah, I'm I think sure it will get re-released at some point. Yeah, I, I will say that their whole like when the bomb goes off in the movie theater, you at, you're experiencing something that's like a shared thing with everybody else in that room, where it's like pretty quiet and it's really interesting. Um, and yeah, a movie like this, like it's three hours long, it doesn't feel like that at all. Man, it just goes bam, 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 bam. Yeah, it just it does clicks. fly by. But yeah, it was very good. Very much enjoyed it. Okay, so uh, shall we uh, go back through our movie list once more for our listeners and <clears throat> call okay. it a show? My my top 15 from 15 to 1. Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Foe. Divinity. Sound of Freedom. Sisu. Bo is Afraid. Evil Dead Rise. Infinity Pool. John Wick 4. Mission Impossible. New Hunger Games movie. The Covenant. God is a Bullet, Oppenheimer, and Talk to Me. And my 15, Skin of Marink, Mission Impossible, Thanksgiving, Tetris, Beyond Utopia, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, The Covenant, Sisu, A Fire, Bo is Afraid, Killers of the Flower Moon, Inside, Talk to Me, Blackberry, and Oppenheimer. We had wildly different uh, lists this year, we, too. We and did. I, I we said sure I did. thought we might. I thought we might, and we did. I, I, I knew you'd have The Covenant on yours. I did. That one was one where I was like, I know he's going to do that, because I love that movie, too. But. Dude, 2023 was a fun year for movies. It was fun. It really was. <clears throat> Lots of different stuff that was out there. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to 2024. Um, you know, I started making my list. Obviously, things are going to start coming out. Um, January looks big as far as, as movies go, but definitely going to be some, some shitty ones. Um, I'm looking forward to Dune 2. Yeah, Dune 2, uh, 
Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey is coming out, uh, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, there's there's a movie called Mickey 17 coming out that I'm looking forward to. Uh, Civil War in in April from A24. Uh, that movie could great. be like complete garbage, and I'm still gonna watch it because yep. it looks insane. Hundred percent. So look at look forward to this one for next year as always, because uh, we're gonna keep this this train rolling. Yeah, and uh, you know I'll start working on my worst movies of 2024 with uh, Bad Boys. I'll add that to the list right now. Let's <laughs> we'll get that out of the way. Poor Adam. All right, that was fun. All right, buddy. Talk to you later. Peace.